All righty, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine, where we explain your favorite mysteries, thrillers, and horror movies. My name is Vic Shai, and this week, my friends, we'll be discussing one of the best South Korean mystery thriller films ever made. That film, ladies and gentlemen, is 2003's Old Boy. Old Boy is brilliantly directed by South Korean director Park Chan-wook. It is the second film of Wook's Vengeance trilogy, with the first being Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and the third film, Lady Vengeance. However, none of the films are connected through a single narrative and are only thematically related. All three films heavily explore the themes of grief, morality, and you guessed it, Vengeance. The Vengeance trilogy truly exemplifies filmmaking at its absolute best, and I highly recommend watching all three movies for an experience that will leave you speechless. Old Boy is my favorite of the trilogy and possibly the most well known, having received a not so excellent American D make back in 2013, directed by Spike Lee. The film tells the story of Odessu, who gets trapped in a room for 15 years without ever knowing the reason why or who is behind his captivity. Old Boy is an absolute masterpiece of a film and I cannot wait to talk about it with you all. My friends, as always, thank you so much for tuning in and feel free to subscribe if you enjoy the content on the channel. But without further ado, turn off the lights and join me as we explore the mysteries in Old Boy. Our movie begins and we see an unknown man holding another man off the edge of a rooftop by his tie and says that all he wants to do is tell him a story. The film then cuts to the inside of a police station we see the same man, Odessu, drunk out of his mind and acting like a complete jackass. Odessu is masterfully played by one of my favorite South Korean actors, Choi Min Sik. Choi brings so much range and emotion to this role which could have easily been cheesy and cringe if portrayed by the wrong actor. I'm looking at you, Josh Brolin. I'm sorry, little one. He says that today is his daughter's birthday and that he bought her angel wings as a gift. Odessu gets bailed out by his best friend, Ju Hwan, and the two make a phone call to his daughter, Jun Hee, and let her know that he'll be coming home soon. Ju Hwan attempts to hand the phone back to Odessu so he can speak to his wife. However, he has vanished and is nowhere to be found. As Ju Hwan calls out for his missing drunk friend, we see an unknown individual standing underneath a purple umbrella who walks away and we see the bag with the angel wings left on the ground. We then get a really neat title sequence involving a clock as time is one of the most important aspects of the film. We now see Odessu in captivity, where the only contact he has with another human being is when he receives food from a hole at the bottom of his door. The room he's being held in resembles a hotel room, complete with a bed, shower, and a television. Doesn't seem so bad other than the fact that he has to stay here for, oh, you know, 15 entire years. A majority of the film is told through Odessu's perspective, and we often get direct narration from him in what he is thinking, almost as if he is breaking the fourth wall, but not quite, as we'll get to later on. Also inside of his room is a single creepy painting of a seemingly tormented face with the quote, laugh and the world laughs with you, weep and you weep alone. He says that every time the musical tune plays, the room gets filled with a sleeping gas which causes him to completely pass out. During this time, Odessu is groomed, injected with an unknown drug, given a bad haircut, and the room gets cleaned. He better remember to leave them a 5 star Yelp review in 15 years. During a news broadcast, we see that Odessu's wife has been brutally murdered a year into his captivity. He becomes the prime suspect as his neighbor said he was always drunk and arguing with his wife. His blood and a cup with his fingerprints on it were also found at the scene of the crime. This shows that whoever captured him is also attempting to frame him for his wife's murder as whoever killed his wife planted the cup that was taken from his room. Odessu begins to go crazy as he starts hallucinating that thousands of ants are crawling on his body. <laughs> 
He shatters a mirror and attempts to kill himself by slicing his wrist, something he does twice during his confinement. The TV in his room serves as his only form of entertainment and also serves as a form of education for him. He decides to write down the names of all the people he may have offended and hurt to try and figure out who may be responsible for his imprisonment. This also serves as a diary for Odessu, who also writes down about his days and thoughts in confinement. Motivated by revenge and having nothing else to do, Odessu begins to train himself to learn how to fight punching out a man drawn on the wall. This causes his knuckles to get huge calluses over time. He begins to dig a hole in the wall behind his bed using a spare chopstick. He also gives himself prison tattoos of one line for each year in captivity. He manages to dig far enough to have his hand reach the outside world and gets a mere taste of freedom and reality when rain begins to fall on his hand. One day, after Odessu is passed out from the gas, a woman comes into the room and seemingly hypnotizes him into imagining that he is in a field of grass. We then see a large red suitcase in the middle of a grassy field that Odessu suddenly pops out of. The field of grass actually turns out to be a super shabby rooftop with some grass on it, which I thought was hilarious. He finds another man sitting at the edge of the roof holding a puppy, seemingly contemplating committing suicide. He walks over to him and begins caressing the man's face, embracing the true first contact he's had with a human being in 15 years. The man doesn't have a clue what's going on but disregards Odessu's strange behavior, as he is caught up in his own emotional feelings about suicide. He asks that even though he is no better than a beast, doesn't he still have the right to live? The man falls backward and Odessu quickly grabs his tie, showing the events that led to the very first scene of the movie. <laughs> What an absolute savage! He tells the man the story of his imprisonment. The man is then about to tell him why he wants to commit suicide, but Odessu suddenly walks away because he just doesn't give a f- During his elevator ride down, we see that he is super awkward at the sight of a woman. He steals her sunglasses for some odd reason, and as he walks away, the man from the rooftop falls to his death. I wonder if that could have been avoided had Odessu just listened to the man's story as it seems he just wanted to be heard. But this ain't your movie, man. Odessu runs into a couple of street thugs and provokes one of them by stealing a cigarette out of his mouth. He brings up the good question of whether or not 15 years of imaginary training can be put to use and proceeds to beat the crap out of all the thugs. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Some homeless man approaches him and hands him a cell phone and a wallet full of cash. He then heads to a local sushi shop and tells the sushi lady that he wants to eat something alive. He then receives a phone call on the cell phone from the very man who imprisoned him. He asks the man who he is and why he was locked up. The man tells him that the important thing is not who, but why he locked him up. The man tells him that be it a grain of sand or a rock, in water, they both sink the same. The sushi lady then serves him a plate of a real living octopus, which he disturbingly eats in its entirety. The sushi lady then touches his hand and he immediately passes out cold. He wakes up inside of the sushi lady's apartment, whose name is Mito. Total awkwardness ensues as Odessu barges into the restroom and attempts to force himself on Mito, who manages to fight him off. She says that she understands why he did it and that she does have feelings for him but that she just isn't ready. She says that when she's ready to make love, she will sing the song, The Face I Miss, and that he might as well drop his pants when he hears that. We then get a really weird scene of Mito and a huge ant sitting on the subway. She says that people who hallucinate about ants are really lonely, just like he did during his imprisonment. We later find out that his daughter Jun Hee was adopted and now lives overseas. Odessu says that he won't reach out to her until he kills the bastard that imprisoned him. The search for the truth finally begins by eating a ton of fried dumplings at several different restaurants all called Blue Dragon. He does this as while imprisoned, he was fed nothing but fried dumplings from a restaurant called the Blue Dragon, something he discovered when a piece of paper with the name was accidentally left in one of the dumplings. Old Boy has several subtle scenes of humor like this one spread throughout the film that are absolutely hilarious and make the movie so much more enjoyable to watch. We then see Mito speaking with an unknown person online with a username Evergreen, who asks Odessu how life is going in a bigger prison and quickly logs off. This makes Odessu suspicious of Mito as whoever that was is clearly related to the person who imprisoned him and he determines that he can't trust her. He finds the dumplings that was served to him for 15 years at a restaurant called the Violet 
Violet Blue Dragon and follows the delivery man to the exact building where he was trapped. Once there, he finds the owner of the building, Mr. Park, who runs an entire business of imprisoning people. He tortures Mr. Park by brutally ripping out his teeth as payback for the 15 years of imprisonment. Mr. Park tells him that he has no idea who hired him but that he recorded the phone call. We then get one of the coolest fight scenes in cinema history, Old Boy's famous corridor fight scene. Everything about this scene is just amazing. The single long shot of the fight, the rawness and realism, the soundtrack, as well as the choreography truly make this one of the best fight scenes I've ever seen. The shot of Odessu looking exhausted as we see all the goons he destroyed in the background is also totally epic. After kicking some more ass in an elevator, he walks outside bloody to many shocked onlookers and faints in the middle of the road. A kind bystander helps him out and puts him in the back of a car. We see that the man knows exactly who he is and that helping him out was no coincidence as he calls Odessu by his name. He listens in on Mr. Park's conversation with the unknown man who paid to have him imprisoned. When Mr. Park asks why he wants him imprisoned, for so long, the man simply replies, Odessu talks too much. The next day, he visits his best friend Ju Huan, who runs an internet cafe. Ju Huan doesn't recognize the voice on the tape and says that Odessu should look into those close to him. After seeing Mido chatting online again with Evergreen, he ties her up and begins to question who she is. Ju Huan tracks down the Evergreen ID to an apartment directly across from Mido. Odessu rushes over to the apartment and finally comes face to face with the man responsible for his imprisonment. Odessu rushes the man with a knife, but the man says if he dies, the truth as to why he was imprisoned dies with him. He also says that he has a cardiac pacemaker and can kill himself at any time if Odessu thinks about torturing him. Kill him and get revenge but never find out the truth. That's a tough one. I probably would have gone for immediate revenge. He tells him that he has until July 5th, five days to find out why he was imprisoned, or he will kill Mito and all the women he loves. Realizing he left Mito tied in the apartment with the door open, he rushes back over to find Mr. Park and his goons inside. Mr. Park has a brand new set of teeth and wants revenge for having his teeth ripped out. <laughs> Just before he is about to pull Odessu's teeth, he receives a call from the unknown man and his assistant hands him a briefcase full of cash to let Odessu go. Before he leaves, he tells Mr. Park that he will cut off his hand for touching Mido's breast. During the drive home, a clearly traumatized Mido begins to sing the song The Face I Miss, and the two proceed to make love in a hotel room. While asleep, gas begins to fill the room and the man enters wearing a gas mask. He creepily lays in bed next to them and caresses Mido's body. They wake up to find a purple box containing the chopped off hand of Mr. Park, something the man wouldn't have known to do unless Odessu was bugged the entire time. He removes the bug which was planted in the heel of his shoe, and then tries to figure out the significance of the name Evergreen. They find that the name comes from Evergreen Old Boys, the name given to alumni from Sangnok High School where Odessu and Ju Huan attended. They go to the high school and look at the alumni records from 1979, and find that the man's name is Lee Wu Jin, and that he was their class Mate. While looking through the yearbook, Mito finds a purple envelope with a flyer to the Water Wheel Hair Salon, undoubtedly another clue left by Wu Jin. He calls Ju Wan over the phone and the two begin to talk about Wu Jin's sister, Li Sua. Sua committed suicide by jumping off of a dam soon after Odezu transferred out of the school. Ju Wan says that she was a slut and there were rumors that she slept with everyone in school. Unbeknownst to him, Li Wu Jin is sitting directly across from him and listening in on the entire conversation. Ju Wan's vulgar insults towards his late sister enrage him and he proceeds to murder Ju Wan by stabbing him with a broken CD-ROM multiple times. He was a true nerd that lived in front of a PC and died in front of a PC. May he rest in peace. Wu Jin tells Odessu that because he removed his tracker, Ju Wan's death is on his hands. Odessu is now enraged and swears that he is going to kill Wu Jin. I absolutely loved Li Wu Jin's character, portrayed by actor Yu Ji Tae. He is the perfect nemesis to Odessu and isn't just a generic evil bad guy. Odessu hurt this man so much to the point of him wanting to get the ultimate revenge, and this scene reflected that on screen perfectly. Yeah!
He gets into contact with Mr. Park via his dentist, and we see that he is now sporting a fake hand. Mr. Park now has a new prison building and has a grudge against Wu Jin for cutting off his hand. Odesu decides to hide Mito with Mr. Park so that Wu Jin won't find her. He visits the Water Wheel Hair Salon and pretty much gets all the answers he needs, because no one gossips more than your hairstylist. While speaking with her, he keeps looking down at her knees for some odd reason. They discuss the rumors about Lee Su Ah, but the hairstylist doesn't know if any of them were true. She calls up an old friend named Chun Shim, who tells her that Ju Huan told her about the rumors and that Odesu would be the one to ask about because he knows them best. Looking at her knees trigger a memory in his mind, we then see a flashback of Odesu in high school. He tries to flirt with Su Ah, but she isn't impressed. While leaving some graffiti on a chalkboard, he notices Lee Wu Jin running down a set of stairs with a camera and decides to follow him. He follows Wu Jin to an old classroom, pretty isolated from the rest of the building. Inside, he sees Wu Jin and his sister, Su Ah, teasing each other. He then witnesses the two engaging in incest. Su Ah holds up a mirror to herself so she can get a better view of what's going on and seems pretty pleased with what's happening. However, she quickly notices Odesu peeking at them from the window and he quickly runs off. He immediately tells Ju Wan what he witnessed and tells him not to tell anybody. Ju Huan tells him that he has a date with Chun Shim and that he's got to go, and this is undoubtedly how the rumors about Wu Jin and Su Ha spread to the rest of the school. Odesu now realizes that Li Wu Jin blames him for his sister's death, who died on July 5th. Odesu couldn't keep his mouth shut and started the rumors that led his sister to commit suicide. Mito doesn't believe that someone would want revenge for such a small thing as Odesu never meant to cause any harm. However, he repeats the quote, be it a grain of sand or a rock, in water, they sink the same. Showing that according to Wu Jin, the rumors hold the same weight as if Odesu had killed Su Ah himself. Mito tells him that now that he knows the truth, he shouldn't pursue revenge and let Wu Jin go, and the two can run away happily together. However, Odesu says that he can't let it end like this and that he must confront Wu Jin. This later turns out to be the wrong thing to do as Odesu chooses the path of revenge instead of forgiveness. Revenge is what got him imprisoned for 15 years of his life in the first place, and now that he is also choosing to take revenge, when will it end? He is able to find Wu Jin's location by deciphering text from the Bible that Wu Jin quoted earlier. Like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Free yourself. This text is from Proverb chapter 6 verse 4, with Proverb being another word for Maxim, the name of the building Wu Jin is located. He enters the elevator and attempts to go to the penthouse floor, but it requires a password. He tries different variations of 6 and 4, but none appear to work. Suddenly, Wu Jin and his bodyguard Mr. Han enter the elevator. Mr. Han enters the password 0604 and the elevator begins to go up. Inside the elevator, Mr. Han hands Wu Jin a small gun. They exit the elevator and two guards attempt to grab Odesu, but he quickly disposes of them with a toothbrush. <laughs> I once saw him kill two men in the bar using only a toothbrush. A fucking toothbrush. Odesu says that Wu Jin slept with his sister and that he started the rumors that led her to commit suicide. He believes that Wu Jin erased his memory and sent him on the search for the truth. Wu Jin tells him, however, that Odesu simply forgot that he spread the rumors as it was none of his business to begin with, showing that we shouldn't spread rumors about other people's personal business. It may not mean anything to us and we may easily forget them, but to them, it could mean everything. He says that Odesu's rumor grew to the point where people started saying that Su Ah got pregnant. He tells him that his sister began to believe she was pregnant, which actually caused her to become pregnant. Which makes absolutely no sense, but I believe what he meant was that no one would have known otherwise if it weren't for him. Odesu then accuses Wu Jin of pushing his sister off of the bridge, as there are several pictures of her before she died hung up on his wall. Wu Jin laughs this off and reveals what he truly did to Odesu. He says that he hypnotized both him and Mido into falling in love with each other. He says that hypnotist Miss Yu instilled in him specific instructions to follow once he was released. Those instructions were to be carried out when given specific sound cues. The melody on the cell phone made him say the words, this caused Mito to react and touch his hand, which then caused Odesu to pass out, all this beginning the chain of events that eventually led Odesu and Mito to falling in love. Once fully dressed, Wu Jin takes out a laser pointer and points it at a purple box, the same kind of box that held Mr. Park's chopped off hand. 
Odessu opens the box and finds a photo album containing photos of him and his family before his imprisonment. He sees several pictures of his daughter, Jun He, whom he has not seen in 15 years. As he progresses through the pages, we see the pictures of Jun He getting older, and to his complete dismay, it is revealed that Jun He is actually Mido, and that Odessu was tricked into sleeping with his own daughter. The last page of the photo album is a mirror, forcing Odessu to take a good look at himself after realizing the truth of what he's done. Also with the written quote, laugh, and the world laughs with you, weep, and you weep alone. We also see Mido in her hotel room wearing the angel wings that Odessu bought for her before he was captured. Mr. Park then enters the room holding a bag. Enraged by the revelation, Odessu rushes Wu Jin with a pair of scissors, but gets his ass handed to him by Mr. Han, who throws him around the room several times. He manages to stab Mr. Han's ear with a pair of scissors, damaging his hearing. An angry Mr. Han tries to stab Odessu with a pair of scissors, and Wu Jin calls out to him to stop. Knowing that he cannot hear and will not stop trying to kill Odessu, Wu Jin shoots Mr. Han in the back of the head and kills him. He then tells Odessu that it was stupid of him to hide Mido with Mr. Park, as Mr. Park was already paid off and getting his hand chopped off was just a ploy to trick Odessu. This reinforces the fact that Odessu shouldn't have trusted anyone when he got out, especially not the person who was paid to imprison him for 15 years in the first place. You done goofed, Odessu. We then see Mr. Park sitting with Mido with a purple box in front of them. They receive a phone call from Odessu who begs her not to open the box and that he will come for her soon. The scene that follows is perhaps some of the best acting I have ever seen. Odessu begins to beg Wu Jin not to tell Mido the truth about her lineage. Choi Min Sik displays such a wide range of emotions from pure rage to complete despair, hopelessness, and desperation. <laughs> Wu Jin finds all this completely hilarious and doesn't feel an ounce of remorse for his enemy and fellow old boy. In a complete frenzy, Odessu then grabs the pair of scissors and proceeds to cut off his own tongue. This is the equivalent of the Japanese ritual of Yubitsume, where an individual cuts off a finger, in this case a tongue, in order to sincerely apologize and atone for having wronged Wu Jin. He then gives Wu Jin the cell phone, who then calls Mr. Park. He takes a look at Odessu and you can still see the disgust he holds for him. However, his look changes to one of pity and he tells Mr. Park to leave the box closed. He holds the gun to both of their heads and asks what else does he have to live for. However, he spares Odessu and drops the remote to the cardiac pacemaker controlling his heart. He begins to walk away as Odessu grabs the remote. He makes it to the elevator and Odessu presses the button, thinking it will kill Wu Jin. However, as the elevator opens, the room fills and echoes the moans of Mido and Odessu having sex. In his last chance at salvation, Odessu was unable to let go and forgive Wu Jin for all the pain and suffering. He chooses to exact revenge and is instead forced to face the reality that he engaged in incest with his own daughter, a direct consequence of his own actions. In contrast, Wu Jin was finally able to forgive Odessu and chose to spare his life and not subject him to any more pain. In his parting words, he tells Odessu that despite knowing everything, he and his sister still loved each other. He asks Odessu if he and Mido can do the same. Alone in the elevator, Wu Jin has a flashback of the moment right before his sister's death. We see Lee Sua leaning back over the railing, being held onto by a distraught Wu Jin. She asks him to let her go and takes a picture of herself, telling him to remember her. She then tells him that she has no regrets and Wu Jin lets her go. Present day Wu Jin then shoots himself in the head inside of the elevator. Wu Jin dies with a look of pure sadness on his face, showing that in the end, having exacted revenge on Odessu could not heal the pain or fill the void of losing a sister. In the film's final scene, we see that Odessu has been narrating the entire event in a letter to Miss Yu, the hypnotist who hypnotized him in Mido. She tells him that she has no reason to help him, but was persuaded to do so by the last sentence he wrote. Even though I'm no better than a beast, 
Don't I have a right to live? The words spoken to him by the suicidal man in the beginning of the film. We see that Odessu has asked Miss Yu to hypnotize him into forgetting that Mito is his daughter. She splits his personality into two people. The one who doesn't know the truth is Odessu, and the one who knows the truth is the monster. She says that once she rings the bell, the monster will begin to walk away and eventually die a peaceful death. She rings the bell and Odessu wakes up lying in the snow and Miss Yu is no longer there. Mito appears and tells him that she loves him. The two embrace and we see Odessu begin to smile and joy. However, his smile changes into one of pain and sadness as the movie ends, leaving it to the viewer's own interpretation as to whether or not Odessu knows the truth about him and Mito. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Old Boy. This movie was an absolute roller coaster of an experience. The story is absolutely amazing and had some of the best acting I've ever seen, especially from lead actor Choi Min Sik. The ending to Old Boy absolutely shocked me and is something that you're not likely to forget, as it's something that truly sticks with you. The music throughout the film was also some of the best music to accompany a film that I can remember and is truly beautiful. I definitely recommend this film to you all and I wish that I could see it again for the very first time. It's just that good. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, I hope you enjoy the video. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to subscribe for more weekly content just like this. My friends, thank you all for tuning in. I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.